Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. My name is Vanessa Ibarra, and I'm the director for the Mayor's Office of International Affairs for the City of Atlanta. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our fourth track and to our session called Empowering Women in Communities. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our partners, especially the Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative, led by Executive Director Monica Dolores Hooks and her colleagues Ashley and Mary for helping all the various departments to put this incredible event together. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Labs Group for this platform, CCI for the interpretation that they're going to be doing throughout the session, and our partners, Invest Atlanta, One Atlanta, and Workforce Atlanta. And of course, our many speakers joining us here today to share with us timely and life-changing information with our audience. And for the members of the Consular Corps and our national partners and local partners that are joining us today, welcome, welcome, welcome. Before we get started, please know that you'll be able to ask questions by submitting your questions in the chat box. For those of you that speak Spanish, we went ahead and added a button below, which will take you to the Spanish translated session. And I'll briefly speak in Spanish. Me llamo Vanessa Ibarra, soy la directora del Departamento Internacional de la Ciudad de Atlanta y les damos a todos la bienvenida a nuestra sesión llamada Empoderando a las Mujeres y las Comunidades. Si tienen algunas preguntas y si quieren ver la sesión en español, por favor hay un botón abajo donde dice español y ahí podrán escuchar toda la sesión en español. So why is the Office of International Affairs involved in this? Through our work, our office focuses on everything from trade to education, diplomacy, culture, sports, and attraction of global events. In recent years, our office and many offices across the United States and the world have focused on the United Nations 70 Sustainable Development Goals. As part of the goals in our mayor's vision for this week-long event, we are focusing on goals number five, based on gender equality, and number 10, reduce inequalities, as well as number one, no poverty, and number 17, partnerships for the goals. Last year, the city of Atlanta had an incredible opportunity in partnership with the Carter Center to join 12 other cities around the world, such as Chicago, Buenos Aires, and Dublin, to just name a few, to be the very first cohort of a global campaign entitled Inform Women, Transform Lives a campaign focused on, a raising, on raising awareness about women's rights to information and to increase the number of women accessing key information specifically from the municipal government. Because we know when we equip women with information, we not only empower them, but we provide them the opportunity to uplift themselves, their families, their communities, and consequently increase our local and global economy. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Laura Newman, the director of the Rule of Law Program at the Carter Center, who has been a key partner in making this campaign a success, and my partner in crime, Sissy Weldon, project manager of the One Atlanta office. As part of the campaign, the city has, has focused on promoting various services and programs through ATL Strong platform. You can see all the information about the various initiatives and services on atlstrong.org slash inform dash women dash and you can see this on the group chat and in there you can see that we're focusing on a few key areas including gender-based violence economic mobility community safety health just to name a few and i could talk on and on and on about this campaign and the work that we are doing but please be sure to check out our website and dial 311 if you don't have access to internet now with that i'm going to show you quickly the video of the Inform Women Transform Lives campaign. If you'd like to see it in Spanish, there's also a Spanish version that you can click on, look on the chat box as well. When you're in the dark, life can be hard to navigate and solutions may feel out of reach for women in our city and around the world, it can be even more challenging to access the services we need. And without a clear way forward, we hit a dead end. Fortunately, we have a right to information and information is power. Power to transform our lives, our families 
and our communities. Informed women can secure municipal services like clean water, improved infrastructure and electricity. Services that meet our basic needs. Informed women can draw on social protections like job training, disability allowances and food subsidies, enabling us to improve our lives. And informed women can have meaningful voices by participating in public meetings, being a part of decision-making and engaging local officials, all of which strengthen our communities. Informed women can access the kinds of benefits that benefit us all. And with the support of our city government, neighbours and family members, we can build communities that are more secure, peaceful and prosperous. Inform women. Transform lives. Isn't the video great? Please be on the lookout for the campaign signs at the airport and soon in MARTA. And to receive updates about the campaign, please feel free to text INFO for women to 888-777. I repeat, text INFO for women to 888-777. Now let's get to why we're all here today. Investing in programs and policies that support early brain development yield significant returns for children, their families, communities, and the economy. Our first speaker is Brittany Collins. Brittany Collins is a trusted strategic advisor and equitable education advocate with over 10 years of experience. She currently serves as the founding director of PACT, Promising All Atlanta Children Thrive, a citywide alliance focused on improving outcomes for children ages zero to five years old who grew up in Atlanta. With that, Brittany, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. How are you today? My name is Brittany Collins, and I have the absolute honor to lead PACT Promise All Atlanta Children Thrive. Convened by Gears, PACT's vision is to ensure families in the city of Atlanta have what they need to ensure all children have a strong, healthy start and are prepared to reach their full potential as citizens of our city. Our mission is to create a citywide alliance of public, private, and nonprofit partners working collaboratively to improve outcomes for Atlanta's youngest children. We focus on accelerating change in Atlanta by facilitating collaboration among entities that serve young children and families raise and align funding, and build public will and advocating. We call for both public and private investments in young children and focus on early learning, health, and other family supports. Um, PAC prioritizes four key objectives to drive change. We work alongside our partners to invest in best practices and models that increase access to high quality early learning environments, health services, and building public awareness and engagement about the early years of life. Um, so, I mean, at this time, families are truly facing hard decisions right now when it comes to work and childcare. And studies have shown that these issues are impacting women's participation in the workforce at an alarming pace. Childcare access and affordability, quite frankly, were issues many Atlantans were facing in the rest of our country before the pandemic, but COVID has truly shown a spotlight on just the severity of these issues. So, you know, if we look at this slide, this is data pre-pandemic, but over 26 of Georgia parents and children, Georgia parents and caregivers with young children under five reported significant changes to employment as a result of childcare issues. And as we think about retaining people in the workforce at the time, 30% of millennials said they would change jobs if they had um, access to a reimbursement benefit. To move forward. Um, in 2021, Gears commissioned a statewide survey of about 400 parents with young children ages zero to four that focused on a range of topics, including childcare arrangements and satisfaction levels, 
general attitudes towards perception of and preferences for childcare. Um, thinking about financial and unemployment and employment impacts in relation to childcare during these times. And as you can see from some of our stats on the slides, about 81% agreed that the pandemic has changed how they think about childcare. A significant amount of families had to quit a job or not take a job because of issues with childcare. And last, 88% agreed that the pandemic really demonstrated the importance of financial resources when it comes to accessing child care. So one of the barriers families face when seeking employment is physical access. So let's zoom in on the Douglas cluster on the west side of Atlanta. There are significant disparities in access to child care um, settings as we think about the supply that's needed or the supply that exists today and the actual demand that's needed. Areas with large gaps between childcare supply and demand can be found across the Metro Atlanta region. However, many of the communities that experience these gaps also have high concentration of poverty. Another real barrier is financial access. Simply put, parents cannot afford the high cost of care. In fact, the cost of high quality care for an infant in Atlanta can cost up to 40% of a low income family's salary. And while we do have a state program that provides childcare scholarships to low-income families, funding constraints mean that we serve only about 14% of eligible families um, that can access that program. So to respond to that barrier, um, we've created the PAC scholarship powered by Quality Care for Children. And this program ensures that infants and young children ages birth to three can access affordable high quality childcare at a quality rated program. So with this investment, families pay no more than 10% of their income on childcare and the PAC scholarship pays for the rest. Enrolled families receive the scholarship and so their child transitions into a free Georgia pre-K program. And ideally this allows for uninterrupted, uninterrupted employment for the family, but also continuous access to high quality early learning programs for the child. And it's truly our approach to have a two generation strategy in place. We're also working to help stabilize childcare supply across Atlanta neighborhoods by directly investing in childcare programs. So last summer, PAC partnered with Quality Care for Children and Reinvestment Fund to provide, to provide stabilization grants to childcare providers located in the city of Atlanta. And the purpose of this grant was to help them sustain their businesses as they dealt with whether it was rising PP, PPE costs or decline in enrollment, what we knew to be true is if we're already facing supply gaps before the pandemic, it was critical that we were able to invest in these providers who have always cared for our young children. So through the PATH Fund for Quality, um, we provided grant funds to stabilize and preserve the existing child care market to ensure options would be available for families when they did, when they were either continuing to work or when they returned to work. We deployed over $1.2 million to 62 child care providers in the city of Atlanta. And as you can see from some of the stats on this page, the majority of these programs were women owned and owned by um, women of color. Um, last, I'm super excited to announce the launch of PAC's first citywide advocacy and awareness campaign. So as you're driving around the city, you may also see billboards, interior bus ads, and online ads aimed to increase, the aware, to increase public awareness of the importance of the early years and really shine light on the reality that access to high quality care and education is not accessible for all families and caregivers in the city of Atlanta. And the ads feature young toddlers with the message, if Atlanta doesn't invest in their education now, we'll pay for it later. Honestly, now is the time to build a system of early care and education that works, is responsive to the needs of working women, and we need voters to use their voice on the local, state, and federal level. So whether you are a business in the city, such as what you see now, there are specific actions that you can do to support caregivers in your workplace, particularly caregivers 
um, caring for young children. Um, there's a role for local electives. There's a role for just a, a citizen who wants to support. So we all have a role to play and we really aim for this campaign to provide guidance to a wide array of constituents across the city to help you um, engage and ensure that we are taking care of our youngest children. But we know in order to take care of our youngest children, we also have to think about the caregivers that care for them every day. Well, thank you all so much for your time and please, please make the path today. Uh, if Atlanta does invest in their education now, we truly will all pay for it later. Um, it's been a pleasure to share more about our work and eager to learn more from the rest of my panels. Thank you so much, Brittany. And a statistic that I saw the other day that really shook me is the fact that about 3 million women left the labor force because of the pandemic. And many reasons being because they wanted to, they had no option but to mm -hmm. take care of their family, to take care of their children. And the majority of the women were still the ones providing the care for the children. And so, as you mentioned also, the fact that for low-income families, this is the care that they want to provide for their children can cost up to 43% of their salary. There's certainly a gap there. And I think it's something that all corporations, government institutions need to consider in order to, as you mentioned, retain that talent. So I'm very glad to have you here. Thank you for sharing that information. And just so everybody knows, all these resources are going to be available on the lab's platform. And so if you did not, if you have any questions, we're happy also to connect you with our speakers here today. Thank you, Brittany. So the vision of our next organization is to ensure that every child in Georgia has access to high quality care and education, regardless of income or location. Our next speaker is Pam Stevens. She is the Deputy Commissioner for Child Care Services at the Georgia Department of Early Care and Learning. With that, Pam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I really enjoyed Brittany's presentation. It just, um, so, so great to hear all the partners we have in trying to provide high quality early education for all of Georgia's young children. You know, the decision about how and wh where to send your child for childcare is hugely important. And as Brittany said as well, it's a very expensive decision. And, um, you know, you think about it when someone is choosing childcare, they're choosing care for a child, for someone who cannot speak for themselves. You know, so you are just totally have to trust that you're choosing the right place. And, and, and that, and we wanna do everything we can to like the video said, which I loved the video, Vanessa, that it's information, information is power. And we wanna inform people on how they can make the best decision possible for their families. And what we know and what our research tells us is that overwhelmingly mothers make childcare decisions. So it's a hundred percent about women in the workplace because you can't work if you're worried about your child. And when we think about people and women in particular leaving the workplace and, and not being part of the economy and all those issues, we, we don't ever want it to be because they were unhappy with their childcare decision. We want to do everything we can to empower them to make really, really good, solid, strong decisions. So if I come on my next slide. So I just want to talk briefly about what we have at the Department of Early Care and Learning to help parents make that all important decision for their child. First, you know, it's kind of, there's kind of a progression, actually. My department, my division is child care services. And what we do is license child care. And then we ensure the health and safety of children in child care by monitoring them and uh, giving them technical assistance and training to make sure that programs are always improving their quality. So if you're looking for childcare, families are ever looking for childcare, the first question to ask is, are you licensed? That's, that's just the foundational piece for all of this. Are you licensed? Um, you know, cause you know, sometimes we like to think about, you know, just the sweet lady down the street or whatever, but we wanna make sure that there are all these systems in place to make sure that children are getting everything they need while you're working so you don't have to worry. Um, so that's again, foundational. Are you licensed? Our CAS program, um, Brittany Bear, uh, briefly mentioned it. Um, it's a, our subsidy program to help families with high needs pay for childcare. As she said, 
We wish that it covered all the families who needed help. We, we really did, but it's, it's a good program. It's a solid program. It's called CAPS and it's our child care subsidy program. And it's again, to help all families who, as many families as possible, uh, receive child care subsidy to help pay for the very expensive high cost of child care. Um, then we have our quality rated program. Brittany mentioned this as well. The best tool a family has is qualityrated.org. If you go to qualityrated.org, you can put in your zip code. It will show you all the child care that's on your route from your house to your office. It includes um, licensed child care centers and licensed family child care homes. And it will also show you their quality rated star rating. So quality rated is our system in Georgia for rating programs for quality, one, two, or three stars. Because when you're making these hard decisions, when families have to make hard decisions about child care, they shouldn't have to be a child care or early childhood education specialist to be able to make a good decision. There are people here in our offices, in our agency, who have done that work for families, who go out and assess for quality so that you can make a very, very informed decision about where you're sending your child. And then lastly, we have the Georgia's Pre-K program, which I think that the Georgia's Pre-K program has been here for more than a couple of decades. And I don't know if, I think to a certain degree, we've gotten used to it and we just don't pay that much attention to how great and wonderful it is that Georgia has this pre-K program, that most states don't have high quality universal pre-K. So in Georgia, if you are four years old and you sleep in Georgia, you are eligible for Georgia's pre-K program. And it's again, a high quality, well-researched, critically acclaimed program. And we are so lucky to have that here in Georgia. So if you think about it, you know, there are a lot of tools out there to help families make really good, responsible child care choices and to support their choices. So again, first question, are you licensed? And if you need subsidy, you go to our CAPS program, you go to qualityrated.org to find a star rating for a program in your area. And then when your child turns four, you register the Georgia's pre-K. So thank you. And I look forward to hearing our next speaker. Thank you so much, Pam. And thank you for highlighting all the various resources that are available. As the common theme is child care is essential. It's good that we know that it is highly rated. Uh, it's also good to know that there are various programs out there that are also going to be able to help you out when it comes to the cost. So thank you very much, Pam. Our next speaker is Tiffany. And Tiffany Bryan, she's representing the city today. She is a native Atlantan that has led youth programming for 21 years with the city of Atlanta. She actually also oversees the Centers of Hope which is part of the Department of Parks and Rec. So with that, Tiffany, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And it's so wonderful to be on this panel with so many people that provide such excellent resources. But today, we're gonna to talk about how Parks and Recreation is more than just sports and art, outdoor activities. When we think of recreation normally, um, unfortunately, people only think of sports, but we're so much more. And with the support of Mayor Bottoms, during this past pandemic, we were able to implement one of the first small learning pot programs by a municipality in this area. And when we created the small learning pods, we ensured that we were completely compliant with all CDC guidelines. We were in 17 locations. We were we had assistance from local organizations that provide a tutorial experience experience as well as proctors for those spaces. And we ended up being able to serve almost every city of Atlanta public school within our recreation centers. Those students came in, they worked in groups of five. And as you can see from the pictures, they got a lot of personal attention. But that's just one of the innovative things that we do with the city of Atlanta's Office of Recreation. Next, please. Everyone knows about Camp Best Friends. I'm a native Atlantan. I wasn't a Camp Best Friends baby, but everybody around me was. And Camp Best Friends has been around since the Mayor Jackson administration. It was designed to provide a safe haven for kids. And 
in addition to being an in-person summer camp this past year, we were also virtual the year before during the pandemic. And we did have to make some tweaks and some changes. The wonderful thing about Camp Best Friends is you not only get recreational activities and experience locations like our Lake Alatoona location and the various recreation centers and the amenities that they have to offer. We provide swimming, we do academic enrichment, we do cultural programs. So the kids really do get to spend the summer in a space of exploration and exposure, which has been one of the most critical components for our programming over the last several years. We also assisted with the academic recovery program with Atlanta Public Schools. And so within our various um, summer camp locations, we had specific locations that started a little earlier that allowed for students to come in, participate in the academic recovery program in the morning, and then transition into recreational activities in the afternoon. We were very excited about this process. It was a, a natural extension for us because of the learning pods, but it was also, again, something new. And I must add that the academic Recovery Academy, as well as Camp Best Friends, are all available with a learning with a um, fee structure. So if you need support in making those payments, our fees are already wonderfully low, but we have mechanisms in place that will assist. Our virtual Camp Best Friends program was piloted at the beginning of the pandemic, and we covered everything from STEAM to physical fitness. We did Camp Best Friends time with a different location every morning. And so the kids who participated got to really become a small community. And the goal was to make sure that our parents who were at home who had had their children during the pandemic really got a chance to rest for a little bit. And so for four hours every morning, we were able to go ahead and draw them in with help from partners like Dance Canvas, a local small arts organization. We had help from the Youth Science Academy. We had help from after school all stars at providing everything from yoga to boxing and we end up having a really good time and had a actually a major competition to see which site got the most views on Facebook live. So we were everywhere this summer. Next slide. Our Atlanta Teen Leaders Program is one of our strongest programs in that it provides activities for our teens 14 to 18 and we've just moved into including the Junior Academy which addresses your middle school students. The goal was to have a space for our teens to come this summer and receive exposure, practical work experience, but also participate in some fun activities as well. Most of our students this past year were from the Atlanta Public School System. They had either been in our after school program or they just heard about us word of mouth. And thanks to Mayor Bottoms, we were able to add an additional over 100 positions for teens this past summer that were paid. So, and you'll see, this was our actually um, our flyer for that. The process was simple. They came into actual City of Atlanta employee position, seasonal employee positions. They received payment like City of Atlanta employees. They were required to submit timesheets in a timely manner in order to make sure that they were paid. But in the process, they also provided valuable support for our Camp Best Friends program because with the smaller groups, we wanted to make sure that our participants this summer were not only engaged, but that they got a little more attention than they normally did, considering that they spent the majority of the school year at home. And that's pretty much it for us. We have a plethora of activities. We'd love to see you come out. Based on fees and needs, we can go as low as free. Um, but then our prices are reasonable. Summer camp is $35 a week if you're a city, if you're a city resident or city employee, and 65 if you're an out of state, out of city resident. So thank you so much and come and visit the City of Atlanta Parks and Recreation Department. We've got lots of things for you in all 33 centers. <laughs> That's my elevator speech. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And y'all have really done incredible work during this pandemic. 
specific, specifically with the learning pods. As I have mentioned this before, the fact that we, we have to be aware of the digital divide that the city of Atlanta faces and how many children were very much being left behind, unfortunately. And so thank you for very much leading the efforts with the team at Parks and Rec to make these available. And I've also had the opportunity to meet some of these uh, youth counselors that you'll have for Camp Best Friends. I had the opportunity of going to the Adams Park location perhaps about five years ago, and we had the opportunity of interviewing them. Uh, they thought that we were interviewing them just to pick a few candidates, but at the end, we announced that we were actually getting all of them to be part of Camp Best Friends. So it was fantastic, and I really applaud you all for the work that you have been doing. So with that, before I open up the floor for questions, I do wanna make you aware of an upcoming event that we have taking place as part of the Inform Women Transform Lives campaign and also part of Elevate. What you see here is a mural image that was provided by the muralist Sarah Neuberger. And so at the Chastain Arts Center, we will be able to paint the mural along with the artist from two to 6 p.m. If you look on the group chat, you'll be able to see the link to be able to register. But we are very excited for the opportunity to be able to engage with the community about this incredible project and for you all to learn more about what the campaign is doing to inform and transform the lives of women and strengthen our community. And I will also like to show a video from Mayor Bottoms talking about the campaign. Hello, I'm Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, and I'm delighted to share with you information about a campaign that the city of Atlanta is participating in with the Carter Center and 12 other global cities, the Inform Women Transform Lives campaign. This campaign supports our city's equity agenda by ensuring that women in Atlanta have access to information that can help strengthen them, their families, and communities. Atlanta's local campaign, Inform Women, Strengthen Communities, is connecting women to city services and programs, which we all know is important as we continue to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. To learn more about the campaign, please visit atlstrong.org or atl311.com or call 311 if you're in Atlanta. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bottoms. And so now I'm gonna open the floor up for questions. I don't see any questions right now in the chat box. And if I don't see any in a couple of seconds, I have a few questions that I would love to ask our panelists. And so my first question to all the panelists, we've invited you all to come and speak. We have an audience consisting of corporations, nonprofit organizations, government officials, students, what else can the city of Atlanta do to best support you and our communities when it comes to the child care piece and engaging our youth? For the Office of Recreation, it's to just come out and talk to us in our recreation centers. Call, see what we have offered because Everything ranges from your traditional sports to art classes in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs to academic assistance. And we find that a lot of times because they're so busy, a lot of people don't want to go inside, but there's always someone in one of our recreation centers that's there that's willing to provide advice that probably gives unsolicited advice, but can definitely direct you in more than one way to make sure that your needs are met. I think for the Department of Early Care and Learning, it's kind of what Brittany's message was, is that everybody has a role, right? I mean, this is too important. You know, the care of our youngest children is, there's nothing more important than that. And, you know, we as a state agency are doing what we can, but also municipalities, cities need to look at their own communities 
see what the needs are, see how we can support in a better way, in a very real way, see where there are shortages in childcare, see what the barriers are to access. And also, I think, and again, an important thing that Brittany brought up, the workforce. We are having huge staff shortages in childcare right now. Um, we need our best and most nurturing and brightest to be working in this industry, but it, it's, it's a difficult industry um, in that, you know, um, it, it's not the most lucrative industry. It's a very rewarding work, but it is not the most lucrative. What can we do in communities to make that better? What can we do to help the, to help the workforce? What can we do to make childcare more accessible? I think it is everyone's responsibility and taking a deep dive into what's going on in your neighborhoods and your communities and seeing how we can work together, how corporations can support families and finding the right childcare and then supporting those childcare programs and partnering with them to strengthen the program would be amazingly helpful. Okay, Pam, I'm having some tech issues, so I'm on my cell phone, so we're going to keep They're going. They're completely fine. <laughs> um, I think Pam said it, said it eloquently, but as we think about supporting women and ensuring that child care is available or ensuring we have a thriving early childhood workforce, it is looking at the local municipalities to say, how can we leverage some of the state funding? What does it look like to expand our own local child care resource so families are able to go to work, whether that's for you know, public officials or public servants in our city? So I do think there's, there's opportunities for that local governments can play. I think there's things that local school boards can play. Uh, I would like to highlight Atlanta Public Schools. They implemented pay parity for their pre-K teachers. They didn't have to do that, but that was saying, although we may not have young children in our class, we may not have young children in our system. There are certain policies that we can get behind to ensure we're thinking about the early childhood workforce as well. Um, and would always be happy to dig deeper into that conversation to highlight best practices across the country to see what makes sense for Atlanta. And so I have a question that I do believe the diplomatic corps would ask. At the Office of International Affairs, we focus a lot on virtual exchanges because we think about corporations and the, important of, the importance of having a global workforce and also being an understanding to different cultures. Is, would there potentially be an interest as part of the early child care education piece for the children to learn other languages from a very young age? Is this something that has been considered in the past? Absolutely. I mean, I mean that's, that would be an amazing resource for families and children. I think everyone knows that children benefit the best the younger they are being exposed to different cultures and different languages. And that would be amazing. But again, you know, we always talk about um, how expensive it is to child care is for families. But, you know, I'm going to speak on behalf of the providers for a moment. You know, if you wanted to get into a business to make a lot of money, there are a million things you could do besides child care. <laughs> and I think that, you know, we've got to hand it to our child care providers who have chosen this huge challenge of providing care for children and families as their business choice. And they don't always have the resources to do everything they would love to do for families and children in their programs. And so resources around um, learning languages uh, in childcare would be, I don't know anyone who would not love that. And do you have any, and I'm saying this on behalf of the audience, do you have any career fairs that are coming up in order for us to be able to share it with our audience? or organizations that would be happy to support in any shape, way, or form? Virtual or in person. I know with the pandemic, a lot of things have shifted. But if there's any that are coming up that we can have various folks sign up, I'm sure they'd be very happy to do so. Well, for us, we, you know, we don't really hire people in the child, child care field. We're a little bit removed from that, you know, because we're not a provider. We, uh, support providers and monitor providers and all that kind of thing. But um, so I, um, we don't have anything like that right now. Yeah. I would say same for us. We don't necessarily hire them, but we do think about resources and investments for childcare providers or directly to families. So if there was someone that, you know, worked in the city of Atlanta that wanted to provide free professional development to our childcare providers, 
I think that would be a conversation um, that folks were willing to have. But as Pam shared, our childcare providers are strained. Um, they are not, this is not a career where they are, um, it is extremely lucrative and they're giving their all, I would say, personal, everything that they have to ensure they're able to provide high quality care for children. Um, so what I've seen from my seat is that partnerships are critical to bridge that gap between what childcare providers are able to actually give to their children and what they would love to give if only there were resources available. And would it be possible for y'all to share? Not right now. And what we're going to do is, as I mentioned, all of this is going to be recorded. And we want to make sure that everybody has access to this recording and the conversations that we're having. A list of resources. If there's some sort of committee where people can voice the importance of early childcare, if they can sign up, if there's a petition they can sign, if they can mobilize more corporations to bring awareness to the shortage that we have right now when it comes to folks. As you said, it's not a very lucrative career to engage in, but to highlight the importance of having folks to be there for the early education piece. Would you all be able to provide those resources for us to be able to compile them and put them in this platform? Absolutely. And let me just say one other thing, because I don't want to discourage anyone from ever wanting to work in childcare. You know, it is a um, very family friendly career decision. I worked in childcare for a very long time um, because I wanted to be with my children. You know, it was this wonderful situation where I wasn't having to drop children off somewhere else and then go to work. We went to work together and it was kind of amazing. And so, you know, again, it may not be the most lucrative work in the world, but it, it is extremely rewarding. It is extremely family friendly. Um, many child care centers, if you have children of your own, offer a discount for your child care costs so that maybe you're not making the biggest hourly wage, but then you've got this really big child care benefit. So I would never discourage, I would encourage anyone who might want to enter this workforce that it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's amazing work too. It's sometimes everything can't be measured in, in how much money you're making, although that is very important. I don't want to, for a minute, think that that's not important, but there are a lot of benefits to working in childcare. Thanks, Pam. Um, and absolutely for us as well, again, one of the key objectives of the campaign is to raise awareness on the importance of early learning, but more importantly, give businesses, local elected officials, school districts, the tools that they need um, to say, if you wanna support, these are very specific ways to support, um, as well as lifting up some of the resources that many of the PAC partners are implementing today in City of Atlanta. So would certainly love to share those resources. And last, I will just, highlights the importance of federal advocacy at this moment. Um, we're talking a lot about the need for childcare investments and there's roles for everyone to play. So our focus at GEARS is really thinking about increasing awareness of some of the opportunities at the federal level and voices and stories are critical. So we'll be happy to share some of our action alerts to ensure that Georgia's voice is front and center as we're making some decisions about what could be historic investments in the early care and learning system. I think that's really important. I think, I think we need to remember too that on every level, whether it's city, state, federal, that what COVID did was highlight the importance of childcare. Um, when the schools shut down, school edgers went either to um, Parks and Recreation Department in the city of Atlanta or to their childcare program. I mm -hmm. mean, the childcare programs, whenever everybody else was closing down, childcare was there. Childcare has been there from day one because they were, we weren't going to have essential workers if we didn't have childcare. We weren't going to have doctors, we weren't going to have nurses, we weren't going to have people at the grocery store. So it's, you know, let's remember that what COVID has taught us is that childcare plays a crucial role in everything operating. And that we have to remember that let's take a good long hard look and see how we can strengthen this industry. And from personal experience, I will echo that. I do have a four-year-old and I know how difficult it was for many women. I had, of course, the opportunity to be able to work from home. But as you mentioned, Pam, a lot of folks don't have that opportunity. They have to be physically at work. And that goes back to why so many women left the labor force, unfortunately. And now, don't we want to get started on the gender pay gap and how long it's going to take for that to close? 
But I think it's, it's important. And if anything, COVID really highlighted how crucial good child care is. And so with that, I don't see any more questions in the chat. So I would be happy to give you all 60 minutes of your time back. But to everyone joining us here today and the speakers, again, all this material and all these various resources that we have been discussing are going to be part of the lab platform. This is being recorded. And so you may see it later on when able to do so, perhaps with your children running around in the background, but we're happy to support you. And I want to thank again, our partners for taking the time for being here with us and bringing forth very important and timely information. So with that, thank you all. And I wish you a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you.